Brethren, a blessed morning to all. We welcome everyone and greet you all with God's love this morning. After more than a year of online fellowship, let us all say thank you, Lord, for keeping us and protecting us both spiritually and physically in this time. Brothers and sisters, this morning as we remember the Lord's Supper and His covenant with us, His children, allow me to lead you to Isaiah 53. And let's read together from verse 4 to 11 where it reads, However, it was our sicknesses that he himself bore and our pains that he carried. Yet we ourselves assumed that he had been afflicted, struck down by God, and humiliated. But he was pierced for our offenses, he was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wrongdoings of us all to fall on him. And in verse 11, let's continue. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, for he will bear their wrongdoings. Amen. This morning, let us be refreshed and remember the Lord's boundless love for us and his great sacrifice on the cross to redeem us. And let us all come before him in gratitude and praise. Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Our holy God, thank you, Lord, for your ever-abounding love and faithfulness for us, your children. Lord, we remember your work on the cross and your continuing call for us to bear your cross and follow you. Thank you, Lord God, and we ask that you give us strength to be more like you and wisdom to follow in your truth as we continually return all glory praises and honor to you alone this we pray in the mighty name of jesus amen oh let us sing of his goodness Salvation belongs to our God Who sits upon the throne And unto the Lamb Praise and glory Wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever, be to our God forever and ever, be to our God. Forever and ever. Amen. And we, the redeemed, shall be strong in purpose and unity. Declare. and thanks, honor and power and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God God forever and ever be to our God forever and ever be to our God forever and ever Amen Amen. Oh, we praise you, 
thank you for your mighty work on the cross, Lord. We just continue to praise. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Oh, let's sing this to Him. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember no wrongs he has done Omniscient, all-knowing, counts not their sum Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. is more stronger than darkness new every morn but since they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more. Join me for a word of prayer. Let's bow down our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be one in heart and mind, as we continue to worship you through the meditation of your word. Thank you for your grace to know you more and be like your son in our thinking and way of living. May your Holy Spirit deepen our grasp of your design and ways we ought to live by the help of Christ. Lord, use me as your mouthpiece to bring out your truth in a relevant, inspiring, and purifying way. All for your glory. In Christ Jesus' name, we pray this. Amen. Our meditation is titled, Implications of Jesus' Resurrection. It is at this time of the year that many of us flock to our churches to commemorate and celebrate the rising of the Lord Jesus from the dead. I know that in some observances of this occasion, they employ an elaborate reenactment of what they perceived of the details of the events that had taken place at the first resurrection more than 2,000 years ago at the garden tomb in Israel. I just don't know how it will be pursued at this time amidst the growing number of infections, particularly in our country. But our circumstances cannot prevent or limit us in worshiping the Lord together to highlight His glorious rising from the dead. 
So let us read our passage in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 to 18, and verses 29 to 31. It says here, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying and they said to her woman why are you weeping and she said to them because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. And as we continue in verse 19 to 31 in John chapter 20, it says, So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see 
in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. May God continue to bless his word as we meditate upon them today. Brethren, on that morning of Jesus' resurrection, when they reached the tomb, they were surprised that it was open and Jesus was not there. The heavy stone was taken away not so Jesus can come out because his resurrected body could always walk through walls. It was removed to enable the disciples to go in and see. The question is, what do you see in the resurrection? The resurrection is of great importance to the Christian faith. Without the resurrection, all else loses its meaning. Let me say that the purpose of this message is not to prove the resurrection happened. Volumes of scholarly work in Christian apologetics are available, which are excellent with the facts of Christ's resurrection. My focus is on the implications of the resurrection to us than the facts of it. Two questions for us to answer today. First is, what are the implications of the truths and facts of the resurrection for us as followers of the risen Lord? And the second question is, what does Jesus expect us to do with the knowledge of his resurrection. The answers are summarized in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 to 19, which says, let me read for you here. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. God's word in 1 Corinthians 15 implies the following theological truths. First is, the resurrection of Christ confirms the claims of who he is. And let me read the passage again, just in case you did not catch it. Beginning in verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, the Apostle Paul said. 
you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Brethren, without the resurrection, Jesus was not the Savior. He is just a good teacher and has no ability to defeat death and sin. Did you hear me? The resurrection proves that Jesus is who he said he was. The resurrection validates Jesus' divinity. It sets him apart from all other great religious leaders who have ever lived. Gandhi remains dead. Confucius remains dead. Buddha remains dead. And Muhammad remains dead. All the religious leaders and founders of their belief remains dead. And their graves are with us today. With them still in them. But Jesus is alive. He alone is the true Son of God, the way of salvation. Friends, if Christ is not raised, we have wasted our lives when we turned our backs on the world to follow Christ. Why? Because this world is the only option other than Christ. So if Christ is not real, we might as well eat, drink, and be merry. Just as 1 Corinthians 15.32 says, But Christ has been raised from the dead, according to verse 20 of our passage. The resurrection proves Jesus is who he says he is. Now, lots of people make big promises but we are never sure they will be realized. Jesus claimed and promised he would rise from the dead. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says, if I may add, Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Hallelujah, brethren. Praise the Lord. As John S. Wales said, the Gospels do not explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains the Gospel. Belief in the resurrection is not an appendage to the Christian faith. It is the Christian faith. Now, brethren, how shall we give an answer to those who question the credibility of our biblical faith. We say Christ has risen. The second theological truth implied by God's word in 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection of Christ confirms our clearance from condemnation. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. This passage lays down a foundational truth regarding our standing with God as the righteous judge of all. It is quite obvious for all of us what the implication is to appear before a judge with clear and grievous violations. But Jesus' resurrection clears us of God's condemnation of sin. As Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 says, and let me read for you. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A deeper insight into this blessed truth is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 to 14, where it says here, 
But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all times those who are sanctified. That's why I underlined that part. Let me read again as it tells us, for by one offering, he has perfected for all time. He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. In other words, the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins was so complete that Christ perfected us for all time by that one sacrifice. This implies that all our sins were forgiven, past, present, and future sins on the basis of one sacrifice of Christ. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, we are still in our sins. We are still bearing our guilt and we are still under condemnation still alienated from God, still unforgiven. When we are in our sins, we get what sins do to us, namely, eternal condemnation. Though it gives us momentary pleasure, but it leads to eternal damnation. As Romans Chapter 6, verse 20 to 23 says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Christ's resurrection is the clear evidence that the death of Jesus satisfied the Father's standard of righteousness and holiness in relation to the sin of Adam and Eve that brought mankind condemnation. The resurrection demonstrates that Jesus has successfully fulfilled his mission to save us. And this brings us Romans chapter 4, verse 25, which says, He who was delivered over because of our transgression and was raised because of our justification. The resurrection proves that the Father was satisfied by Jesus' completed work of redemption, assuring us that our guilt has been removed. The blood of the Lamb shed has paid every debt that we owe. The blood of Christ has paid everything. The resurrection of Christ from the dead is like the official receipt that confirms that full payment has been successfully made and satisfactorily accepted by God for our sins. That's the resurrection. It's like a receipt for the full payment for our sin by our Lord Jesus Christ. In simple terms, brethren, by Christ's death and resurrection, God having become our Heavenly Father and we His children no longer view us for judgment and condemnation. Romans 8, 1 affirms this truth when it says, and I've memorized it, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Not that God tolerates sin in us, but on the merits of Christ's death, He deals with us as sons and daughters like our earthly fathers. God, as our judge, no longer has any thoughts of condemning us as children, but when we sin, He disciplines us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 and verse 10 states it more accurately than I can. It says, For those whom the Lord loves, He disciplines and He scourges every son whom He received. For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good so that we may share His holiness. All God's people who by faith in Jesus are now being progressively sanctified because now we have definitively been perfected or made acceptable before God for all time. And that by one sacrifice, the perfect, all-sufficient sacrifice of Jesus, of His own blood, the resurrection of Christ, is now the permanent proof of this privileged position we have before God, the Father. How shall we answer and assure those who are in doubt because of the uncertainties and difficulties of the situation we are in now? We say Christ has risen. The third theological truth implied by our passage in 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection of Christ confirms the convincing changes God continuously affords us. Once again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 17 to 19, let me read it for you. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ had been raised from the dead, the First fruits of those who are asleep. The Apostle Paul is pointing out that the resurrection of Christ confirms the compelling truths of our own bodily resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, which is the context of our passage from verse 17 to 19, as we Go to verse 52 to 55. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. God's word tells us. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory Oh, death, where is your sting? This means we will no longer endure sickness, suffering, or pain. As Revelation 21 verse 4 says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mournings or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Brethren, we may be enduring chronic pain, illnesses, or old age. Some of us may be suffering emotionally. Some might be lonely or hurt by loved ones, by friends, and others. 
Jesus' resurrection confirms that we will be raised in perfection. We will never again sin. As 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. Some of the things that cause us great pains in this life are our own sinfulness. Let me say that. Our fears, our worries, greed, anger, and lust. This causes us to suffer pain. Many times we suffer and we die because of our own sin. But many are suffering and dying also because of the sin of others. Because of the greed and the corruption and the insensitivity of others in this world today. Thank God the resurrection of Christ confirms the amazing changes that will transform us in God's timing into the likeness of Christ so we can share Christ's glory. As Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 to 21 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble estate into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Brethren, do you now understand the great importance of Jesus' resurrection? So we can be complete. If Christ has not been raised, then all the promises in God's Word in the New Testament that guarantees sufficiency in this life and the next are unreliable. And Christ is not seated at the right hand of the Father to make everlasting intercession for us to secure our competencies to be sufficient in all of life's situation. Christ's resurrection from the dead strengthens us to endure anything in this life. It is like a comprehensive insurance policy taken out for us. The resurrection of Christ gives us complete coverage, not only for the challenges and uncertainties of this present life, but also in the next life. This is the only way we can go on and live the life that Christ modeled and commanded us to live. How shall we give hope to those who are in fear, anxious because of the painful realities of life, of cancer, of COVID, of sudden death, and the likes? We say Christ has risen. Let me highlight some details in the account of the resurrection in the Gospel of John that might prove significant for you in verses 11 to verse 18. John tells us here, But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping, and so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. 
Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. You know, I could not help but be impressed by Mary Magdalene's love and devotion to Christ. Mary would not leave the tomb when Peter and John went away to their own homes. Commitment to Christ made her look for his missing body so she could secure it. And though she lacked in spiritual insight at that time of the resurrection, Mary was blessed with a rich reward. She saw the angels whom Peter and John had not seen. She received consoling words from them and was the first to see our Lord and to hear His voice after the resurrection. The point I'm driving at is Mary Magdalene got a first-hand experience with the risen Christ. Now, imagine the lasting impact that personal experience created in her life. Imagine what she felt and the comfort and the confidence of where she was coming from when she announced to everyone, I have seen the Lord and that He had said these things to me because of the resurrection. Brethren, Jesus is alive. We can encounter Him for ourselves. That is the message of our gospel. The risen Lord wants us to personally experience Him so we may believe. I am not even talking about seeing the Lord with our physical eyes, though He may allow that. But He can touch you and me today. I had my first encounter with the risen Christ some 40 years ago when I was stricken with panic seizures and depression. My health deteriorated so badly that I thought I was going to die at the age of 24 years old. I felt God was unfair. What I did not know then was that God's way was to give me a personal experience of the reality of Christ. And He brought me back to health. And since then, Jesus has been my Savior and Lord through the ups and downs of life. We must continue to seek that personal encounter and experience the reality of our Lord. Or else, we really have nothing burning and alive in our hearts to share about Him with others. During this day of the year, many churches in the different streams of Christianity celebrate this occasion dubbed as Resurrection Sunday. But may I ask, are we simply commemorating and celebrating this occasion? Or... Are we truly living out the implications of Jesus' resurrection? A.W. Tozer, in his daily devotional paperback, Renewed Day by Day, wrote, and I quote, I cannot give in to the devil's principal deceitful tactic which makes so many Christians satisfied with an Easter celebration instead of experiencing the power of Christ's resurrection. It is the devil's business to keep Christians mourning and weeping with pity beside the cross, instead of demonstrating that Jesus Christ is risen 
in me. I pray that through God's Word in our study and meditation today, we will be able to see through the horrible and painful realities of our suffering, particularly in this pandemic to be able to see a much greater light of hope than just surviving the infection and the restoration of the previous normal routines and flow of daily living. I pray we see a future hope of a perfect state of existence that will never end. As Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And so in conclusion, we may not know and control what twists and turn of difficulties and troubles this life may throw at us. But the truth of Christ and all of who He promised to be for us, the truth that clears us from the condemnation and wrath of our holy God, and the truth of the convincing changes that our Heavenly Father affords us, confirmed by the resurrection, will Give us hope and courage and peace to be steadfast in Christ. Let's ready our hearts for communion. Mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend The agonies of Calvary You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your Son Who drank the bitter cup reserved for me Your blood has washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. By your perfect sacrifice I've been brought near Your enemy you've made your friend Pouring out the riches of your glorious grace Your mercy and your kindness know no end Your blood has washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Bless your name, O oh God Lover of my soul I want to live for you Lover of my soul I want to live Your blood 
has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank your blood. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. Yes, oh God, we praise your name. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Brethren, if you are ready with the elements for communion, let's first allow time for self-examination and let us acknowledge and confess our sins before God. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, Look into our hearts, Lord. Examine us, O oh God. We lay bare our hearts to you, Lord, our whole being. Lord, remove from us and pardon us for sins, Lord, we have done knowingly and unknowingly, Lord. That renders us unworthy. Lord, in celebrating this communion in remembrance of you. Thank you, O Lord. Together now, brethren, let's come before the Lord. And before we partake of the bread and the cup, let us join in prayer. Lord Jesus we thank you for the symbols of the bread and the cup that represents your life, lived for the purpose of the Father, and was given up for us for our redemption and restoration to communion with him. And Lord, this cup, the symbol of the new covenant, the best arrangement of God with us through your obedience at the cross. Help us to live the new way of life according to your resurrection. Embolden us with courage as you defeated death and hope for your imminent return to take us to be with you. This we ask in your name. Amen. Together, let's partake of the bread. And the cup. Let us continue to thank the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we hold you in holy remembrance today. And we thank you for all of what you have accomplished for us by your death and your resurrection. Thank you. Lord Jesus. Brethren, let's now close in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for nourishing us with spiritual food through your word and encouraging us with the implications of your resurrection. Grant us grace as we continue in this new month amidst the challenges and threats we face. 
Allow us to be victorious over the deceit and temptation we encounter from the flesh, the world, and the devil. Bless us with your peace that passes all understanding and give us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord, we ask this. Amen. Now for the benediction. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. And the blessings of God Almighty. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit protect you and guide you now and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Go in peace and the love of the Lord to serve Him with gladness with all your heart. God bless you. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. darkness new every morn but since they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more